Hello, and welcome to Culture Shock. I'm Evan, and this is Brent. What are we talking about today, Brent? Today we're talking about the Meiji era of Japanese history. Meiji era? Yeah. Well, now, when was that? So, the Meiji era went from 1868 to about 1912. So, thinking, uh, you know, from a uh, European perspective, think American Civil War to World War I, hmm. roughly. So, a lot changed, historically, you can think, in that period. And a lot changed for Japan. Hmm. Because the Meiji era marks the opening of Japan to the West. Ooh. Before that, Japan had been closed off completely. <laughs> Watch our previous video about that. Um, and uh, with the Meiji Revolution, uh, the shogun was ousted from power. And uh, Japan was opened up to, to the West through the, uh, the leaders of the Meiji Revolution. Well, now with the shogun being ousted from power, mm. that leaves a gap. What filled that gap. How did that come about? And we know Admiral <laughs> Perry came in and there was, mm -hmm. up until that point, it was a closed system yep. and he opened up trade mm -hmm. and there was a revolution that occurred. So the, the Meiji Revolution was, was interesting because it was a combination of intellectual and sort of martial um, revolution. Hmm. It was led by a lot of intellectuals who um, found the samurai, if you will, to back them up. Ooh. So when the revolution was over, there was this cadre of intellectuals who were looked upon to found a new government hmm. and to establish what this new Meiji government would actually be. Wow. This is actually very advantageous because often when you have a, you, know, you think of a transfer of power in South America, for example, you know, <laughs> uh, the new guy is basically a warlord. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and this happens in lots of different places. But because these are people who had ideals... They could actually formulate and think and come up with a, a reasonable Structure government. in a reasonable way rather than just, you did me a favor, so I'm going to reward you. <laughs> Something built on structure and logic. and Totally. So the, um, these leaders of, the, of, the, of the, the new Meiji government, first they signed what was called the Five Charter Oath. Hmm. And this is this, this initial um, uh, document outlining what they promised to do. Hmm. And the idea was, if we're going to open it up to the West, what's that going to look like for Japan? Right? What are the broad strokes? And so they said things like, there's going to be deliberative assemblies. Hmm. So folks are going to be invited to get together and debate what the new laws were going to be. Oh, wow. Yes, which is very nice. Um, it, it promised the involvement of all classes in carrying out state affairs. So it wouldn't just be the shogun and the daimyos of deciding things. Oh, that's a big contrast. Uh, people are getting involved then. Absolutely. Not just, here's the law imposed on you. <laughs> well, discuss it and we'll think about it. Absolutely. Um, they also announced that they would be abolishing unfair laws. Hmm. So there would be a, a, a serious look at the legal system and the laws and decide what, what made sense wow. and what, what was fair and unfair. Um, part of that was moving the, the capital from Kyoto to Tokyo. Oh, very symbolic. Yes, Kyoto <laughs> being the, um, the seat of the emperor. Hmm. And so now it was move over to a more business-oriented era, a, a, a big port. But they still have an emperor? They still have an emperor. So, hmm. um, a lot of restructuring going on here. Mm -hmm. um, for example, all the, the daimyo, the local lords, are now governors. Oh, they've right. changed their they've changed title. The title. <laughs> right. It's, it's a more Western title, and it, it, it gives them a still power, but a more Western-style power, right? Mm. They're, they're not absolute lords anymore. <laughs> Supposedly. But, you know. Now, as you mentioned earlier in, in our earlier video on this, um, on the, the Edo era, um, only daimyos could actually own land mm. in, in Edo era. This changed. Oh. So individual land ownership was now allowed. Um, now, of course, initially, the daimyo owned all the land because they're the ones that did. But now you could actually pass uh, land. You could own the land you, you farmed. Oh, wow. You pass it on to your descendants, things along those lines. That was a very big deal. Uh, so land laws were passed. Tax laws were passed. Um, and monetary payment was really established as a thing uh, where before you paid taxes in rice. Oh. Now you pay taxes in money. <laughs> that really brings them into a modern era, mm -hmm. uh, using a currency yeah. rather than bartering or swapping. And this is a very symbolic thing, partly for the fact that because Japan was a very agricultural country that's so self-identified as a rice-bearing and a rice-based um, economy, saying that no, now it's all based on money, kind of pushed them away from the previous era. How did they, how did they start amassing some of these ideas and terms 
uh, these more Western style well, approaches? A lot of it was um, intellectual thought that had infiltrated Japan over, over the course Ooh. of time through the Dutch and through other things where they were weeding and finding things that were going out in the outside world and deciding it's, it's time for that. So they studied hmm. a lot of, of other things. Now, um, one of the big things was what was called the Iwakura Mission in 1871. Iwak Iwakura Mission. Iwakura Mission. If hmm. you've seen Seal Experiments Lane, hmm. her last name is Lane Iwakura. Oh, yeah. That's a hint. Hmm. Um, so over 100 ministers and historians and students were all sent as part of the Iwakura mission to Europe and America on a two-year tour. And they were there to study the West, hmm. to see how industry and the economy and all these things were handled in the West. Because the idea was, if we're going to open it up to the West, let's find out what the West actually is. Yeah, find out <laughs> and, and how, to, how to deal with them, what they do, and mm -hmm. you know, what, 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 uh, what it's all about. Yeah. And one of the things they realized is there's, there was so much catching up to do. Hmm. They needed to, 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 to jumpstart that. And hmm. they, they did that by over 3,000 foreign experts were imported back to Japan. Oh, wow. The Japan think Japan. tank to, to develop and... Absolutely. From all across, you know, multiple industries and all sorts of things, to train local Japanese people in how to do all these things. Wow. And they established what are called the Zaibatsu. Have you heard of the Zaibatsu before? Zaibatsu sounds familiar. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think I've heard that They are somewhere. these kind of like megacorps in, mega in corps. Japan. Uh, in fact, when you, when you hear in anime the yeah, term a megacorp or thing, you often in Japanese it's actually Zaibatsu. Zaibatsu. Um, <laughs> and it's referring back to these things. And they still exist in Japan. They are these government sort of kick-started um, industries. Oh. The government would come in and say, okay, we need to start producing steam engines. So we're going to provide the money and the resources and set up a company they will then operate independently. So it's not a government run or... But funded by the government. Funded, yeah. So oh, wow. To government. have a government backer is, yeah. is a strong support for a company to get off the ground. You, you, you really can't go wrong with the government backing <laughs> you. There's, there, there's no fail. They're right. just going to... And especially when, you know, no one else is doing it in Japan. Yeah. You know, it was, so it was very hard to catch up. To those if you, you can take all the technology, you've got the government mm -hmm. sponsor. So the Zaibatsu are still rather controversial in Japan for the mm. fact that they got this huge head start. Um, and, uh, that, and does, that does cause a problem with competition. If somebody yeah. wants to start up a competing company, mm -hmm. how do you compete against a government-backed <laughs> company? Yeah, and, and now, now to be clear, the, the Zaibatsu are not... Um, uh, they were not continued to be run by the government. The, the government would set them up and then let them go. Um, hmm. But because all the resources had already been invested, it was hard to catch up to them. But after a revolution, that sounds like a brilliant approach Absolutely. to get everything caught up to speed technologically and in the economy. Um, and that was that was the thing, and that, that was how those got started. And there, some of them are still running today in Japan. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so all this was happening, um, and uh, you had you know, the monetary system going along. Um, now it still took a long time for the government to really fully establish itself, hmm. and this was very intentional. Um, you don't go from Edo era Japan to an American or British or Dutch style democracy <laughs> in an afternoon. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things. And this was a, a very wise decision on the part of the Meiji leaders of, of realizing it's going to take a long time for folks to kind of get used to this whole process, mm. to become invested in the process. Mm. Um, so it wasn't until 1889, um, several decades later, that they formed and wrote the Meiji Constitution. Oh, um, and this was the you know, the final document that was okay. This is how we're going to run the country, and established a few things. So the emperor still ruled, still the head of the country, but now there's a prime minister. Hmm. Not unlike the shogun in the past, but not with the same powers. Not the same power. No, he was elected by a council. Uh, and there, and elected. Yes, uh, and there's also a cabinet. It, there was also um, elected by the or um, assigned. Um, and it created two houses, kind of like the, the European style. Wow. We have the, the, the um, uh, Senate and the House. They had a House of Representatives, just as we do, and a House of Peers, similar to the uh, British style. Um, representatives were um, only men over the age of 25 who, who uh, paid a certain amount of taxes per year hmm. were eligible for that, kind of much like in, in America. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to be a, a, a certain, certain age, uh, own kind of stuff. land. And um, but it was a you know, step in the right direction. And then the House of Peers made a, a uh, royal family and so forth. It also established rights for the people. 
Hmm. So this is where the right of free speech. People, right, right, individual people. Individual people. That's a big contrast. Before Absolutely. it was the family structure that was mm -hmm. the smallest legal unit. And now we're seeing individual, we're seeing ownership and individual rights. Yeah. Wow. Every single person in Japan. That's, that's revolutionary in itself. <laughs> really huge deal. Um, and so a lot of the, and, and again, they were modeling this off of, of European documents and saying mm. that, um, you know, they recognized that the American Revolution, many other things, it established this idea of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of press were all a, a fundamental set mm. of, of rights that were required to keep things running in, uh, uh, effectively. So they could kind of cherry pick different things from all these Western cultures and <laughs> yeah. get the best of what they um, And they also recognized that um, it, it was important to not just pick what they felt felt was good at the time, mm. that a lot of these systems were interconnected. Mm. So again, you can't just you can't just have freedom of speech and not freedom of the press. Yeah, the, the, the two go right. hand in hand. You know, so so one pulls the other. And... <laughs> so they were very wise to understand all these things. Um, and so they established all, all this, and Japan started to boom. You, know, you had lots of economic progress, lots of military progress. Oh. So suddenly, there was a need for a military, because mm. Japan didn't have a military. Up until then, it was uh, uh, samurai. Yeah, well, was, up until then, and, uh, no other country mattered. Yeah, right? they, they didn't have to, they were an island. Yeah. And, and they <laughs> Just were, they were defend their off. island, they're closed off. They, yeah. Like, um, so suddenly there was conscri uh, conscription for all classes. All classes. Yep. Samurai all the way down. Everybody's um, a part of the machine then. Absolutely. Well, uh -oh. <laughs> ideally. Um, <laughs> the peasants were horrified. Were they? This, uh, uh, yeah. Their I, job? I, 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 that's not my job. I grow rice. <laughs> right. Um, some of them would mutilate themselves to avoid conscription. Uh, partly as a political statement. Wow. Because they were saying, look, I would rather... That's a serious myself. statement to do that. Because mm -hmm. then how do you do your job? You, right. you're, you're making a serious statement when you won't do either at yeah. that point. Absolutely. Um, so this is a, a big deal. And, of course, the samurai were even more horrified. Because they <laughs> oh. had to fight next to these peasants. Oh, oh, the peasants are revolting. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so this, this debased them. S many samurai literally would not stand in formation with peasants. Oh, my goodness. Because it was below them, uh, that, 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 you know. So, 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 so the the structures have changed, but the attitudes and biases <laughs> take a little bit longer. Democracy is not happening overnight. No, no. But that said, a mere five years after the Meiji Constitution was signed, uh, Japan entered the first Sino-Japanese War. Cool. Um, so this is something that doesn't get get taught in American schools that much. Um, yeah. Japan attacked China and won. And won. They won control of Taiwan, little place, <laughs> um, and allowed, the Laodong Peninsula, which is pretty big. Um, and this was a shock because they, had, they attacked freaking China. That's a huge country. It's a huge country. How, so Japan's a small country in comparison. How did they win? Because China had modernized. And Japan had modernized yeah. and upgraded all their technologies. Japan had all the latest technology. China didn't. Now, the twist on this story is that um, several European powers called the Triple Intervention um, came in and, shall we say, negotiated Japan to give back the Laodong Peninsula. That must have been tricky. Uh, I mean, well, they, yes. all the effort they went to, to get that. <laughs> but, you know, including the Triple Intervention was, say, Russia. Um, who basically said, yeah, you're not going to do this. No, you're not going to do this. And we have the power to make sure you're not going to do this. Um, and this was a very bad precedent historically hmm. because this basically told Japan the Western powers aren't going to allow you to do what you have done militarily. Uh-oh. They're going to, if they so want, they're going to deny you what you want. Wow. Oh, who has the final say? I, I can see... Uh... Whose authority is the, oh, yeah. the most powerful at some point? So there. This, this is a little scary. But then Japan scared them again 10 years later when Japan attacked Russia. Oh, my. <laughs> and they won this little place called Korea, you may have heard of. Korea? Yes. So Japan won control of Korea um, in 19, uh, 1904 uh, with the 1904 war. 
Um, and this was the sign to the international stage. Because now it wasn't hey, just... Hey, everybody. Some, yeah, it wasn't just, you know, Asian powers fighting. Suddenly it was Japan fighting Russia and winning. Wow. Um, and winning Korea. I mean, people knew Korea was a significant thing. Um, not that Taiwan wasn't, but, you know, Korea was, was better known. Um, and the fact that Japan was a fully militarized force that could take on an industrialized nation and win was a, a that's, major news that, That's an eye-opener there. Absolutely. Just a few years ago, they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were not able to do this. And exactly. now suddenly they're taking over different countries and defending the fact that they've done that. That's 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 a a big ripple in the uh, international uh, yeah. ocean there. <laughs> yeah, uh, and this proved that, J that Japan's industrialization had fully matured. Uh, mm. That they were now not just an economically mature country, but they're a militarily mature country. It takes a lot of economy to support, support just, that just to build. Yep. Um, so that so anime recommendations for this. Um, uh, two recommendations. One is Rurouni Kenshin. Rony Kenshin. Uh, the TV series is set during the early days of the Meiji Restoration, the Meiji mm. era, and does a good job of talking about how things are changing Ooh. in that period. Oh. Another one would be Peacemaker Kuragane, uh, which is also set uh, during those, uh, actually around the time of the, of the, the revolution. Um, so during those very heady times. Uh, more of a comedy here. Uh, Kenshin <laughs> is comedic, but uh, uh, Kenshin is more of a sort of a uh, comedy, drama, action. Got to have some serious elements, some humor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so those give you a good idea of uh, the Meiji era and how things were, were changing in that time. Wow. Yeah. Exciting times. Very. Mm. Wow. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of Culture Shock. And check out our next episode. We'll be talking about the Taisho era. Taisho. Ooh. Yeah.